Thanks for coming. I've given so many talks in front of a bunch of other tattoo artists that this is really refreshing to be able to to speak to our art appreciator kind of uh, crowd. And of course, most of you are already tattoo fans, and so I don't have to sell anyone here the idea that tattoos are fine art. So in talking about tattooing as a fine art form, uh, I wanted to go into a little history because we've you know, got a very mixed view of what tattooing is. Our culture has a very mixed view of it. And it's, of course, not something that's always been seen as a fine art form, and maybe for good reasons. Uh, it's It's got some roots that, uh, let's just say that people with art degrees wouldn't necessarily have gravitated uh, to a tattoo studio. Uh, it's not what you would associate with fine art. Uh, but it kind of you know, glosses over the fact that, that we have a, a much deeper history than this. This is kind of what we think of when we think of tattooing, is this kind of 1940s, 50s Americana uh, traditional look. And, you know, some of these are places that, you know, your average person might be a little afraid to set foot inside. Uh, but, of course, as we all know, it goes far beyond that. And uh, our relationship with tattooing is something that, as far back as we go in history, we find examples of it. This is a 7,000-year-old statue here from a uh, uh, you know, Neolithic uh, era. Uh, it's about 7,000 years old. These, these marks on these bodies suggest that these were tattooed humans. This one here is another you know, 5,000 years ago, uh, a U statue from the 3rd century BC. And, and again, this is clearly a person with with markings on them, and, and uh, we found mummies from the same era that had these markings. So we know it's been around for a long time. And a lot of a lot of us will start experimenting with tattooing in grade school, poking each other with pencils to see if we can leave a mark. So there's this weird thing, right? Why do we humans want to mark ourselves? But it, over time, it became art. It started out as marks, but even going back to like the Scythian tattoos, this is, you know, again, a few hundred years BC, uh, you start seeing designs that already are carefully considered. And you can already say there's some art artistic thought going into this. And, uh, you know, th this example here is from Virginia in the late 1500s. And so these early examples were were clearly already artistic, you know, especially in the South Pacific Islands. These are cultures that had been valuing tattooing as a sign of status, as a sign of accomplishment, achievement. You were not going to be chief on one of these islands without your proper bodysuit. And uh, But at the same time, there's an artistic understanding here, uh, dating all the way back then. And we think of fine art as being something that has to be approved of. It has to be gallery wall or whatever uh, to, to get that kind of consideration. But, you know, people were getting tattooed, you know, way before this. And uh, Europeans uh, started getting tattooed. Here's Captain James Cook. People were getting, you know, Westerners were getting tattooed before Captain Cook. But... Uh, the word tattoo came back on one of his ships. The Tahitian word tatau came back, and that's kind of when things started to take off. And one of Cook's uh, people, his science officer, Joseph Banks, uh, he got tattooed. Now, he was on the Endeavor because he was part of the aristocracy. He used all of his political pressure to get this place as science officer on this, uh, this kind of prestigious mission. But then he came back with a tattoo. You've got this highly placed aristocratic guy with a tattoo, and people are like, what's this? So a year later, they brought back an actual tattooed native. Uh, this is Omai, oh and in 76, and he was a real sensation. So the people that started getting attracted to tattooing at first were not necessarily what we associate now. We had actual royal getting tattooed. I can tell you a little bit about a payup because I've met some people who've had them done. This is still being done. Uh, there, there are Samoan artists doing payas, and it's a three-day process. Um, it's done using hammer this thing that looks like a, a uh, about this big, and I'll just hammer this on you while somebody else is cleaning up the messes. Oh, and at the end of the whole, 
wander into the ocean and, and let the surf clean your wounds. And then if you're lucky, you won't get an infection. It was a different era, right? We, we do these things differently now. But yeah, from sailors from that era started collecting the tattoos. Uh, um, Captain Cook's sailors did. Now this, this image here is from before Cook's era. This is from 1778. But uh, it became very popular among sailors, and they ended up with a whole language of imagery that meant very specific things, making it home safely, those kinds of things. But it's a tradition that... Uh, you know, is, is still with us today. Sailors get tattooed. But it started with, with Captain Cook's people. And uh, one of the reasons it became popular with the aristocracy, this is King Frederick of Denmark. And there were a number of kings and very highly placed royals who got tattooed. But uh, you didn't see tattooed people walking down the street necessarily. And if you did, these are people who had been to the islands. There was a real mark of adventure and of uh, something exotic that you've done in your life. And it made people seem much more interesting. Of course, now you can get tattooed down the street. And it, it uh, you have to work a little harder to make your tattoo interesting. <laughs> Merely having one has no longer got the power that it had back then. But we had, uh, you know, King Edward the the Seventh uh, in the 1860s was getting tattooed. Um, Grand Duke Alexis, briefly the most tattooed man in Europe, uh, went to Japan and got a sleeve, you know, the kind of thing people would do these days. Uh, Arch Archduke Franz Ferdinand, uh, who sparked World War I, he was tattooed. Uh, so a lot of very highly placed people were getting tattoos. And, and at that moment, the, the reputation of the art was not in the gutter. The, then in 1891, this happened. The machine was patented. This is actually Thomas Edison's electric patented for entirely different reasons. And, you know, a tattoo guy looked at it and said, aha, I bet I could make that work. You know, but up until recently, it was a garage tinkerer's kind of profession. And, and uh, all this invention happened in a very kind of friends getting together and having a beer and and comparing stuff and swapping parts and and talking about their complaints and figuring stuff out. But anyway, let's take a jump around the planet to Japan, where by the mid eighteen hundreds tattooing had taken on this form. We were seeing body suits. And tattooing had a very complex history in Japan. It had kind of fallen in and out of favor. Uh, and for a period, it was not only illegal, but criminals were being marked with very visible tattoos to say, this guy's a criminal. And uh, then there was a book that came out in, in China, a novel that apparently made all these tattooed criminals look glamorous. And, and it became suddenly very popular in Japan again. And all these tattooed criminals went and got bodysuits to cover up their criminal markings. And it, it, it just grew from there. And the, the art, artistic style that is popular in Jap uh, Japanese tattoos is, you know, based on their printmaking tradition, which, you know, if you look at the style of this, the bold line work, the, the active poses, the multi-layered kind of imagery, it very much lends itself towards tattooing. And they really ran with it. It was a, a culture that was just... You know, they happened to have this mainstream artistic style that was perfect for skin. And they developed this, this kind of bodysuit uh, tradition, which, uh, again, that, that's another tradition that carries on to this day. But uh, it was not actually legalized until uh, the, in 1948, you know, American occupying forces after the end of World War I. They were all wanting to get tattooed, and they were like, I want to get in trouble for getting tattooed, so they legalized tattooing in Japan um, in 1948. But uh, even to this day, it's considered a gray industry there, and uh, only quasi-legal. But they're still doing beautiful tattooing in this style. It's something that's kind of hung around and, and uh, uh, continued to influence us. But meanwhile, the aristocracy had stopped getting tattooed. And 
gradually the reputation of, of the art form just kind of, you know, you have got your sailors, you know, imagine seeing drunken sailors partying with their tattoos and, and it just kind of took on this, this lower and lower kind of reputation. And, uh, this is something that, that really settled in, in uh, thoroughly in the, in the mid-century, and no proper person would go get a tattoo. No civilized person would get a tattoo. And, and of course, plenty did, but, you know, they would be ostracized by their own families in some cases. And uh, so badly that, you know, even the scientific community couldn't look at tattooing with a straight face. Here's Atsi, or Utsi, the, the ice man. And he was discovered with a whole bunch of tattoos uh, pretty recently. This is, I think, in the, you know, when did they dig him up? Um, you know, late 1990s, I think it was. And, you know, these are modern scientists. And they looked at him, they found tattoos. And they were oh, okay, they had criminal gangs back then. And, you know, even after taking a look at them, they're like, okay, these must be marks to show how many rival gang members he killed. Or uh, it, it, it took a, a lot of people talking to them and saying, hey, you know, let's, let's rewind a minute. And, you know, if you went to certain islands, you'd have to be tattooed in order to be the chief. But, you know, it took a while for that to, uh, to kind of turn around. And until recently, uh, when tattoo um, archaeological sites they weren't even considered important. They were kind of thrown out with the rest of the refuse. And only recently have they been starting to get taken seriously. This is a 2,000-year-old tattoo implement. And, uh, I spoke to uh, uh, an archaeologist named uh, Dr. Dieter Wolf, who he and some uh, of his colleagues had found a few of these. They're made out of uh, cactus parts. And they found pigment on their uh, on the points and they wanted to prove that they were actually had been used for tattooing and so they found the same species of cactus and they built the same implements and they tried to make inks out of the same things they thought those inks were made out of because they did all the spectrography and everything and they tattooed each other with these things they even put marks on each other that they thought were what these people were tattooing at the time i thought that was great science because they wanted to see if the wear marks, the microscopic wear marks on the tips of these these cactus quills were the same when they tattooed each other as they were in the uh, the old one that they found. And yes, the wear marks were consistent. And of course, it's easy to see this is a tattoo implement, but they had to prove it. But anyway, let's talk about the tattoo renaissance, because we did not stay in the gutter, as a lot of you know. And it's very hard to point at a single moment in time uh when tattooing started to turn around i mean for a long time there it was just being kept alive by 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 the sailors pretty much uh this is sailor jerry collins you might have had a, had a beverage that was named after him uh earlier this evening he had nothing to do with making that rum but uh, i'm sure he'd be cool with it uh so he was in hawaii and he was just a little bit different from the other tattooers at the time. And people were coming to him from overseas and from uh, far away to get their whole backs done because he had a little bit more finesse. He had just a little bit larger vision. Now, the kind of imagery he was tattooing was still my, what you might think of as classic American tattoo imagery, but he was thinking bigger. He was working with these people in a, in a way that would encourage them to, to get larger work. Um, you know, imagine somebody who's not in that kind of mindset, who's got to sit down, shut up, give me your money kind of uh, mentality. Those clients are going to be real uncomfortable and they're going to be real glad when that half hour tattoo is done with. And, you know, they're probably going to need to be pretty drunk before they come in again. Or you get somebody like this who who's thinking a little bit more clearly and, and they're thinking this person might give me their whole back if I'm just show them a little professionalism. So it was the beginning of, of a major turnaround. This is Cliff Raven. He was in Chicago where, where uh, I learned to tattoo. And the guy that I learned to tattoo from, Bob Oslin, had learned from Cliff. And Cliff was also kind of in the Sailor Jerry mold, um, working on overseas clients. And he was uh, you know, doing body suits, large work. Uh, people were traveling for him. He didn't have this tough guy kind of image. He was... Uh, openly gay, which is still rare in tattooing, especially among men to this day. Um, but uh, 
because of that, when I got into tattooing, the guy I learned from Bob Oslin was, you know, a very progressive, open-minded person. It was, it was very refreshing back in 1988 because I was afraid to set foot in a tattoo studio. Uh, but many people that Cliff taught and that Sailor Jerry taught and others like them at the time moved on to become very important uh, in, the, uh, in the field. But what was it like in a tattoo shop at the time? Okay, let's just say you were like me and you wanted to learn tattooing. And you were an artist. You had an artistic background. You had pre-existing drawing skills. Now, this is very rare at the time. And most tattoo studios, you're talking about half-hour tattoos or one-hour tattoos. Uh, and there's definitely not this art vibe, right? And uh, you'd walk in and you'd pick something off the wall. You wouldn't come to them with your concept. They would laugh you right out the door. Uh, here's some drawings done by uh, Greg James. And you can see that there's a tiny little one, you know. There would always be one that's meant for the, that first timer. Only got 20 bucks, eh? You know, just, just, just a taste, just a little taste, you know. Uh, and they were all drawn in such a way that somebody who doesn't know how to draw should be able to trace one of these and still make it look more or less like it should. So that's kind of where the classic American style stemmed from was we need to simplify our designs down to a point where, you know, basically any idiot can trace it and not screw it up too badly. And that's kind of what was available if you wanted to get tattooed. So again, not a lot of people with serious artistic uh, ambitions would wander into a place like that. Um, except for this guy, Don Ed Hardy. And some of you uh, might know him just from the fashion line. Uh, you know, that you saw his like Chinese knockoff bad Ed Hardy fashions being sold at gas stations all around America for a while there. And because of that, some people would never think what an important artist he actually was. Uh, the thing that he did that was so critical was he looked at tattooing and he looked at the his peers, people like Kerry Barba and Jack Rudy and Leo Zuleta, and uh, and he said, "Wow, these people are making amazing art, and nobody really is seeing this." Hmm. I'll publish some books. So he borrowed some money from a tattoo supplier and he published the Tattoo Time books, and they uh, they came out in the late '80s and they ended up in record stores, of all places. And so imagine all these punk rock people with maybe some pre-existing art skills walking in and saying, wow. And I can, I can think of the top of my head of a whole slew of artists in my generation, including myself, who got the bug from looking at Ed Hardy's books. This is Carrie Barba. Uh, she was one of those, you know, innovative uh, artists at the time who, uh, really helped turn things around. One of my big heroes when I first, first was wanting to learn to tattoo. And it was especially difficult if you were a woman wanting to get into tattooing. And she was lucky in that she found some very supportive uh, artists in her community that, that uh, you know, helped give her a push. And one of my favorite stories was when she went to work at convention. And they didn't have a lot of conventions at the time. This was on the Queen Mary cruise ship. And... Uh, She's talking to the the guy, you know, who's I guess the MC and also the ticket taker. It was a pretty small crew, and introduced herself. And later on, he's making the announcement, and he called her the world famous Carrie Barba. And after that, everybody's calling her the world famous Carrie Barba. And she's like, I guess I'll run with that, right? And uh, and so then she's doing this kind of thing, and it's you know it's 1987, and people are just completely blown away. They're like, it's like Japanese, but it's different. It's like, it's different effects, and and uh, they'd never really seen anything like it. She started sweeping the awards, so part of it was just seeing what's possible. Once you see it's possible, and you realize, ah, okay, I don't have to just do tattoos that look like Sailor Jerry tattoos. Because there's this this idea, like I remember when I first started, this is an outliner, and you make an outline like this, and then you put it down, and this is a shader, and you shade like this, and then you put it down. And when you're ready to color, you color like this, and you're done, you know? And this idea that you can approach it like you've got a whole bunch of paintbrushes, and you can just 
paint, you know, as long as you're not overworking the skin and, and you've got, you know, enough technical skill to keep track of what you're doing, you can go pretty far from that, uh, that classic Americana look. And then uh, that's me getting tattooed by Carrie in 1988. That was uh, 89. And this is, I was really, I mean, I had set this as a goal. When I made it to my first convention, I wanted her to tattoo me. And uh, I was absolutely blown away watching her tattoo, seeing her use different needle groups that I thought were just liners. And it's like, wow, you can do all these things. And I had to go get tattooed by her again uh, not long after that. But uh, she is still operating. She's now in one of America's oldest, uh, longest running tattoo shops. And she's just an incredible artist. But uh, what what she's always uh, been known for the most are her wildlife tattoos, which are not strictly realistic. They're very stylized, but they incorporate a fair amount of realism in such a way that uh, it's it's still a beautiful artistic vision that has all the tactile and and realistic elements that that uh, are so rewarding to the eye. And at the same time, they're illustrations and they're imaginative. I particularly love this one. It's a pretty simple tattoo, but just the way that it sits, uh, the strength of the pose, the expression. Um, but anyway, she really paved the way for what we now know as uh, realism tattooing. And we've got people like Steve Butcher, who's... Uh, it's hard to believe that's on skin, honestly. Uh, this guy's from New Zealand, and... Uh, you know the the level of realism that people are capable of now is is it just keeps improving every generation. And you look at the work being done this year, and you're like, "There's no way they can get it any better." And then they do. This is another one of Steve's pieces, and he's he's really well known for his uh, sports scenes and portraits. But this is a major engineering project. You're looking at three days of tattooing here. But he does these great out of focus backgrounds and things like that, and very you know very faithful to the photos. This is another realism artist named Nico Hurtado, and he's one of the trailblazers in realism because I think he's one of the artists that figured out how to strengthen and simplify the photo reference so that it'll make a better tattoo, and so his his realism tattoos tend to hold up very well. This is a two-day project. So, you know, you don't just sit down and real quick have a tattoo done like this. It's a, it's a major acquisition to do something like that. And then you've got movie, movie realism. It's become a huge, you know, uh, because people love movies. It's, it's kind of our modern pantheon. Back in the day, people would have gotten the Zeus tattooed on them. Now they'll get the Joker. Uh, but it's a combination of realism and illustrative skills brought together seamlessly. This is Leo Zuleta, and he's another one of the artists that was featured in, in Hardy's Tattoo Time books. Uh, recently retired, although still, you know, tattooers' retirement tend to be kind of porous. But uh, he uh, came from Hawaii and had a background of, you know, he came from the punk scene, but also had been surrounded by uh, island culture and wanted to try to bring back some of island tattooing, which, by the way, had kind of disappeared because of kind of colonialism and uh, a lot of conversion to Christianity, which uh, somehow that wasn't compatible with keeping their tattoo practices. Um, but he, uh, he appeared in Ed Hardy's Tattoo Time books, and what became known at the time as tribal tattooing uh, became enormously popular in the 90s, just because it was so bold and readable. Uh, this is Leo sitting next to one of his clients, uh, and this is based uh, on a traditional Tahitian design. This has uh, not changed that much. Um, he just sort of modernized and simplified it a little bit and helped to popularize it. Uh, and Leo is, is, uh, has also kind of created much smaller, more accessible uh, variations on that theme. This is a collaboration that he and I got to do uh, at one point. This is another thing that I love about tattooing is there's this incredible spirit of sharing. Um, and I noticed this the first time I went to a convention in 1989. I was this awkward looking 
kid with weird boots. And there weren't a lot of punk rock people at conventions back then. Um, and I had a, a stack of flash I had drawn. I had a few photos and people like Jack Hootie and Carrie Barber were ready to give me the time of day. I was, I did not feel weird or out of place after the first day. Uh, this incredible spirit of sharing. I met other artists that I ended up swapping work with. But anyway, here's Leo and I doing a, a, a collaborative piece on someone and, and, uh, you know, I've learned so much from each one of these collaborations. And so now many years later, I invite younger artists to come to our studio and collaborate. And um, I get as much from them as they get from me, possibly more, but don't tell any of them. This is an artist named Kaoki. He's originally from Hawaii, but now uh, in Atlanta. And he's kind of taken uh, that traditional island tattooing look and modernized it. Um, I love the way that this just wraps around the arm, how you've got different layers, you know, a foreground and a background, which, you know, you wouldn't have seen that in the day. But at the same time, the patterns that you see in there, which are all very specifically symbolic of mountains and ocean, and you know, there's a story being told in here. So he's very well versed in the specifics of uh, the island tattoo language. And he knows it well enough that he can break those rules and, uh, you know, retrofit it uh into you know a new modern take on it i i really enjoy how this one is just designed to fit right there and you know a perfect tattoo should fit the body in a way that looks like it belongs there but then that that whole look what we now know as black work uh expanded beyond the so-called tribal and uh 10 or 15 years ago you started seeing artists experimenting with other patterns mandelas and things like that and uh and since then it's gotten quite elaborate and sophisticated uh this is a guy named Corey ferguson he actually created an app called geometrica which uh you can use to you know generate these kinds of patterns and and play around with different parameters but for instance you could see that pattern in the ditch of the elbow starts out dense and gradually gets more and more open that's the thing that would be hard to draw by hand i mean you could but uh um, creating modern tools to be able to bring back into this ancient art form is, I love it. I love the mix of digital and analog and seeing how far out we can bring an idea, but ultimately it has to be tattooable. It has to be something that an artist can take a hand implement and hammer it into the skin in such a way that it'll heal right. Another one of Corey's pieces. And here he's just going berserk with all kinds of different geometric motifs. Um, Mixing and matching. They're from Brian Geckel. And uh, he uses Corey's app, Geometrica, for some of his drawings. But uh, Mandela tattoos are just, uh, you know, naturally attractive. They just grab the eye. And uh, I think that this this particular sleeve, I've always liked it because of the, the bold use of black and all the different line weights, the various thicknesses of, of negative space lines in there. I just find it really grab the eye. And this is another one of Brian's pieces where he's using color. Uh, so the black work look can also be rendered in color. There's really no limits at all. But you can see the island tribal tattoo just expanded and changed and expanded and changed and mutated. And then it's this. Here we have kind of going back to that Sailor Jerry look, a classic American style, modernized. This is a, a Carbondale artist named Roger Ziegler. And uh, you can see it's that very simple and bold look. And there's, there's this kind of principle that a lot of artists who uh, are into this look follow where you're going for about one third blank skin, one third black and one third color. And so th there's this balance uh, so when you step back and you take a look, it's not just solidly tattooed, which there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not how this look works. And so it, it still celebrates that nostalgic look. It has that classic feel, but it's thoroughly modernized and cleaned up. There's a, a smaller piece of Rogers, and you can see the, the outlines are much cleaner and crisper than anything you'd see from, you know, the 1940s, because they weren't hammered in in 10 minutes, you know, they were carefully sculpted and put in there with the utmost of care. And I love how he's brought in a Van Gogh starry night, night motif, which 
again, you wouldn't have seen that back in the 1940s either. Nobody would have been capable of that. It was only recently that we got all these colors. You know, there was a time when you would have seven colors. You'd see the sign out in front, seven colors, wow. Uh, where now it's just an infinite spectrum. And, and of course, you can mix any colors you want. And, you know, like the color rack that Michelle and I have in our studio has got 98 spots in it. And then we got another drawer with even more. And if we don't have what we need there, we can mix them in a cap. Uh, or you can mix while you're dipping between colors like you would as a painter, you know, just on your palette. So you no longer are limited by color. That's one of the lovely things that's happened. Uh, our colors have changed. Our safety has changed. You know, people don't get infected from tattoos anymore uh, unless they, you know, make really bad mistakes. Uh, our artistic understanding has changed. Uh, all of these things have evolved. Our, the equipment itself, it used to be such a heavy machine. Uh, I can still work an eight-hour day 35 years in because they keep making the equipment better and more ergonomic, and now it's cordless, and yeah, it's quiet, and it's really changed. Jillian Marie, she's doing what is sometimes known as neo-traditional. So it's kind of following that same traditional look, but with a twist. Now, one thing about the traditional look is usually you'd have standalone pieces. It's, they might have a little background, but usually they're going to be surrounded by some blank skin. And uh, generally, it's going to be a tattoo of a thing with maybe a couple other things rather than like a whole scene, right? So the neo-traditional look embodies a lot of that. You'll get various line weight in there, uh, um, wh which can really help spice things up. The, the strict traditional stuff would usually only have one line weight. And, uh, you know, just a slightly updated look, but it's still very much thinking like a traditional artist, incorporating those same kinds of motifs, daggers and flowers and things like that. But there's been a lot of twists, uh, and like what we would consider so-called neo-traditional is such an incredibly broad spectrum right now. It's sort of traditional, it's sort of illustrative. And then we've got the black and gray look. Uh, and this is another... Uh, branch of tattooing that's got its own historic roots. Uh, kind of started in the prisons in East L.A. Uh, now, of course, tattooing is not really permitted in, in the American prison system, and so these prisoners are working on each other in the most sneaky circumstances. And uh, But they developed this whole language, and usually it would be a language of regret and longing and the woman that you missed and there's the prison bars and there's uh you know like they would put all these different things together sometimes there'd be images of jesus this is east la um but this is chewy quintinar and he's he he's kind of celebrating that look but trying to modernize it uh this one is incorporating a lot of south american imagery but again thoroughly modernized and Chewy is somebody you might think of as a fine line tattooer. He he was taught to tattoo by Jack Rudy, who's one of the premier fine line tattooers of the 20th century. But uh, and he's gone for a slightly bolder look with it. But this is kind of the influences that that he's coming from. This is a prison artist, uh, a guy named Mouse Lopez, uh, who's doing life. And he's tattooing behind bars. But this is the look. This is what I was talking about here. All the symbolic stuff, the crying woman, some roses, some death symbols, some gambling symbols, all of these things. That's very much that East L.A. look. Now, interestingly, you've got a completely different prison tattoo culture in Russia where the prisoners were allowed to tattoo each other. And usually the guards were also kind of prisoners, and they're all out in the middle of the frozen wasteland. They've got nothing to do except tattoo each other. And so they did these incredibly, even forced tattoos they were putting on other prisoners as punishment were done very artistic. It's like, I got nothing else to do. Um, and not surprisingly, when, when mainstream modern tattooing arrived in Russia, they had this incredible uh, uh, history of meticulous tattooing and so russian tattooing became synonymous with very meticulous rendering this is the black and gray look but then kind of evolving out of the east la uh you know prison look 
A lot of people love black and gray because, first of all, it's just simpler. You know, it's not, not everybody wants color. Black and gray ages more predictably than color. A lot of people like that, too. Uh, those of us who do color work, uh, we're at peace with the idea that some of the colors fade faster than others and that kind of thing. But, you know, I can understand why not everyone would be. Uh, this is Tenille Napoli. She is uh, from Australia. And I like her work because it's got a kind of a, an open airiness to it. Um, not too bold, but still really using the whole range of contrast. Nice and readable without being overpowering. And that's one thing about the fine line look. And let's go back to Japan. Uh, that Japanese bodysuit look has never gone out of style. And this is one of uh, the premier Japanese artists, Shige, who he's got dozens of bodysuits walking around. And if you follow his feed, he's just constantly doing bodysuits. But what he's doing is also just incredibly meticulous work. Like these are not, he's not rushing through as much square footage of skin as he can. Uh, almost all of his pieces have got these very tricky, like these elements along the, the top here with the yellow outlines. That takes a lot of time to do that stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he tends to, to be very artistic while at the same time still using that, that traditional Japanese look, the layout, the, the symbology. You know, there's a lot of mythology that's incorporated in there. Uh, but then he's taken it into a little bit more of a, a painterly, uh, modernized look. But artists all over the world love the Japanese look. This is a guy named Andre Malcolm, uh, who's in the Bay Area. And he's also, he's one of the people I know who's done the most body suits. And uh, he's also done a lot of work on uh, darker skin clients. And he's really uh, gone out of his way to, to innovate. You know, he's created a, a set of gray washes that are optimized for darker skin. And uh, it's still mostly this traditional Japanese look, but I've also seen him design body suits that are combining some of those motifs with tribal African motifs. He's done some very interesting things. But then the illustrative look, which we see a lot of work uh, that you might just term as illustrative. This is Steve Moore from Canada. Uh, very much borrowing from the Japanese tradition, but not concerning itself with the same symbology and the same you know, kinds of uh, uh, traditional look. It's, it's allowing itself to go wherever it wants, but it borrows a lot in terms of the way we've learned so much from 150, 200 years of Japanese bodysuits that uh, we figured out how to make a back piece where the figure, the character is large enough. You've got some elements around it that might frame off the head and bring attention to it. Uh, you've got a strong balance of light and dark that is going to direct the viewer towards certain elements. Uh, we owe a lot to Japanese tattooing. Uh, but yeah, Steve Moore is incredible. His, uh, he does a lot of kind of symbolic figurative tattooing on this large scale. I love his use of color. Uh, this is a work in progress here, but uh, I chose it as an example. Just I, I really love these hairs and filaments in this. Tricky stuff to do. But bodysuits, not everybody wants to get a whole bodysuit, but they might want to have a balanced and unified look. Uh, this is one of Michelle's pieces. And she's doing what we term body sets. It's not the same as a body suit uh, because it's not going to cover the entire body, but it's taking balance into account. It might be a pair of sleeves coming onto the chest a certain amount and coming onto the shoulder blades a certain amount. They're balanced. Some elements will be symmetrical, but some won't be. Uh, but the whole idea is to wear it like a garment. Uh, you know, the Japanese body suit was sort of designed off a kimono with a, a split down the middle and the way that it ends at the bottom of the legs and that kind of thing. So this is kind of, you know, with that same idea of a garment, but instead of having a hard cut off, there's usually a dissolve. There's usually some skin coming into the tattoo, some tattoo coming out into the surrounding skin. And, uh, and she's been fortunate to have clients who have really been on board with this look that have been coming to her, some of them for 20 years, that will keep just adding on, refining, uh, 
bringing new elements in. And because it's a softer kind of look and, you know, she's deliberately kind of erring on the side of caution with how bold she goes, knowing that her clients by and large are coming back regularly. Uh, it allows her to experiment with a, a, a softer look and still make sure that there's going to be an opportunity to make a tattoo that's going to stand the test of time. And then we get to Biomech, which is one of my favorite uh, styles, although I, I love them all. Uh, this is uh, my friend Killian Moon. He's originally from South America in Atlanta now. I like this one here because of the, the kind of limited color scheme. Interesting mix of geometry and uh, uh, organic elements. And one of the things I love about bio is it's all of the artistic principles except for subject matter. <laughs> You've got composition, flow, balance, you know, all of these things that are important in composition. Um, but you're not burdened with the need to tell a story. And uh, that's very refreshing for some of us. Um, and, you know, like this piece here, this is one of mine. Um, it's, you know, I, I teach uh, tattoo design in, in a course and uh, called Reinventing the Tattoo. And I have these ideas of, of core principles, you know, flow and fit, contrast, positive negative relationships, line weight, uh, you know, things like that. And here's an example of a piece where I'm following all of my own advice. You can see how the line weight in the foreground is much stronger. The background is allowed to fall back. So it's, it's really using a, a lot of my favorite effects and understandings of what works visually, while at the same time being free from having to tell any story other than I want to make it attractive. Sometimes you, I'll get clients that still want to theme it, you know, like this is, I really enjoyed this project. Uh, this person is a nurse and he wanted to celebrate nursing. Uh, he also wanted to bring in a little bit of the cosmic, you know, Fibonacci uh, sequence and uh, body, mind, spirit, which is what we tried to embody in that uh, inner forearm triple spiral there. But it was, uh, you know, a chance for me to really stretch myself. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, being able to rely on, on those graphic tricks and tools that uh, I am familiar with, so I could know that it's probably going to turn out okay, even if it's partly out to, outside my box. I've got a guy here, uh, Sean, who's a, uh, he, he asked me for a, a themed bio piece. A couple of them, I've done two sleeves on them. Uh, one of them is about transcendental meditation which is a very kind of abstract idea. And, but at the same time, it's specific in its own ways. And so I enjoy those, those challenges too. But I like it the most when, when there's enough freedom to really ask myself first and foremost, does it look good? That's the most important thing. So I know I don't need to make this case to, to you fine folks, but you know I, I think that tattooing, you know, Obviously, I think it's a fine art form. I've devoted my life to it. Uh, but uh, it's earned that place. It's the, the people who have practiced this art through all the years have fought to make it a fine art form, have worked very hard to elevate it, to carry it out of the gutter. To uh, we, We've always been very protective of, of our art form, you know? Like, uh, you know, you don't want your friend to do ugly tattoos. You know, you're going to teach him to do better tattoos so he doesn't send people into the world because we feel protective that way. And because of that, uh, there's this, this sense of we're all elevating it together, lifting this thing up as, as an industry. And uh, well, it's, it's been a, a pretty cool project to be a part of. And uh, as a collector, as an art collector, uh, I feel like I can actually give up my skin for, for tattoos because it's good enough. We are now serious art collectors, collecting serious art. And uh, I don't know if we always could have said that. I think people have always loved their tattoos. But now, without reservation, I can say this is a, a magnificent fine art form. And it, it deserves the important place in our culture that it is earning. Thank you all for showing up.
And uh, yeah, and thanks to everyone who sent me art, anyone who's watching this that sent images, thanks for helping me make this possible.